So the very first question is from Michael Corman. It says, how do you know if your niche is too narrow or too broad? What are the signs to look for? Okay, so this is a question I've um, dealt with in a number of places. And let me just take a gander on my website. Uh, but also on YouTube, there are a number of videos about this where I've, I've talked about it fairly exhaustively. You know, okay, some of these things may be actually up in my um, in my membership. Okay, so let me try to answer this question as best as I can, right? How do you know? There's There's no science to this one. But I imagine this is a question a lot of you have, but I can give you some parameters to use. First of all, if you are in a small town, then you're going to have to niche fairly broadly. If you are uh, marketing to the internet, you're going to want it to be extremely narrow. Yeah, if there's only 200 people in your town, there just isn't the population base to sustain you. If it's the internet, there's billions of people. So the, the broader the geographic range, the narrower the niche. That's the first thing. Second thing is, um, it depends how much competition there is in the space. If you're the only yoga teacher in town, just doing yoga may be enough. If there are a hundred yoga teachers in town, it's gonna have to be narrow, you know, it's going to be, well, what's different about your yoga classes? So that's another factor. Do you have something you can, want? Can I, can, yeah, can I, can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, okay, so I'm wondering, okay, if I'm, I, the thing is, because I, I sort of like sense that I see signs that I'm too narrow and also signs that I'm too broad. Okay, so like okay. when I say, I'm wondering if I'm too narrow, because a lot of people are confused by the things that I talk about. If they seem like obscure, esoteric things that people don't understand. So I wonder if it's too narrow. Okay. At the same time, I wonder if I'm being too broad because I can feel myself keeping things generic so that I don't, so I don't confuse yeah. people. Here, here's probably where you're um, getting it screwed up. You're being too, you're being too narrow about the boat, but too broad about the journey. Yeah, so let me just okay. break that, uh -huh. let me break that down for everybody. Uh, I got this from Bill Barron years ago as a metaphor. Your ideal clients are on island A, they want to be on island B. Your business is a boat that can take them from one island to the other. And of course, island A is a metaphor for what's not working. Yeah. Now, the, the challenge is, if somebody comes down to the harbor, and they really want to get to Island B, and you haven't, they don't know that your boat could get them to Island B. And you say, come on my boat, let me talk about all the, look at the woodwork on this, look at the joicing technique, and would you, would you look at those divots there? And would you look at the, oh my God, our mess hall is amazing. And you try to fascinate them with all these details about the arcanum of your boat. They don't care. And the reason they don't care is because they don't see how that's relevant to them getting where they want to go. I mean, they're happy for you. It's real nice for you that you know so much about boats, but it's not relevant to them. And so in niching, the very first thing we need to do is narrow down on the journey that we're helping people on for a service provider. Now, if, you've, if you're a product maker, you do talk about the boat. Yeah. You tell them all about the boat. That is very interesting. But if you're a service provider, you have to be selling the journey. And so then Island A and Island B have to be very clearly defined. Within that, then we can get nerdy about the boat. And the boat is all of your modalities, et cetera. But it also, it could be that you're also getting too nerdy about the, the, um, Point of view too fast too soon you know it's putting the cart before the horse first the relevance then the credibility first the niching then the point of view first island a and island b and then we talk about how we get them from island a to b and then the nerdiness uh, better come out 
uh, then they need to know that we know a lot of stuff about how to make that journey. But if we start with the point of view, if we start with the boat as a service provider and no journey is defined, uh, it equals them just being lost and confused and they don't know quite what to do with us. They can tell we're very smart. They can tell we have a lot of interesting things to say, but they don't know quite what to do with it uh, or or if it has any utility to them. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to understand. I, 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 maybe I have to think about why I'm why I'm reluctant to narrow down on the journey. It's, it's very common. Everybody is, you know, everybody struggles with this. Uh, for those of you who've gotten my starter kit, one of the things that's in there is a, a book around the fears, the 14 fears of niching. Everybody resists this. And the reason you resist it fundamentally is you haven't found the right one yet. Because everybody's scared of the process of niching, but nobody's scared of their niche. That's what I've found after over 20 years of doing this. Like when P, everybody's abstractly, niching makes no sense. You know, you're just cutting off possibilities and, and less people um, and or picking something you're going to get pigeonholed into and you're going to lose all the variety and flexibility. So at that level, it's just, it, it makes no sense. But when people really find out the niche that's perfect for them, it's there's no more fear. It's relief. That's what I see universally. It's just this, oh my God. I'll tell you an example. This just happened the other day. There was a woman uh, who booked a puttering session with me. And now she first came across me eight years ago. Her name is Jenny Good. Um, and she was doing business marketing coaching. And during one of the calls, I said, Jenny, I said, you're very Christian and you're a hippie, which is amazing. You're a Christian hippie. You're a rare breed. And I said, but this Christianity thing seems so important to you. And I just feel like there's something there around the niche. I don't know if it's marketing to, for Christian business owners or, you know, maybe they'd be thrilled. Somebody who, you know, can reconcile their religious faith, you know, with them. Um, with uh, with capitalism and, and money. And then I hadn't heard from her for years, but I just did a call with her the other day and here's what she actually came to. She really thought about it. She said, the Christian thing is important. And the journey that she'd, be, she'd been through was her daughter became a pagan. Oh shit. And this led to her daughter estranging her. I don't want to talk to you anymore. You know, you... Christian mother. So very, very painful uh, for, for Jenny. And she worked through it though. She did the healing work and really looked at her part. Like, where did I push her away? Where did, where, where did I contribute to this happening? What was my part in it? And now that's what she does. She, you know, largely she works with Christian parents whose kids have pushed them away. Now, what's interesting is once you get the core of that island A and B, you realize, ah, this could be also pagan mothers with Christian kids. This could be vegan mothers with meat-eating kids or vice versa. Like, there's a lot of dynamics of this estrangement based on a religion, which doesn't have to, you know, veganism could turn into a religion for people, a kind of fundamentalism. Um, and so, and she's been kind of swamped with business ever since, and she's loving it. It's so meaningful for her. The business niche never really felt quite right. And this did. So if anyone's struggling with the niche the, the, and you're a service provider, the thing that I see the most often is our deepest wound is a doorway to our truest niche. It's something worth going back to over and over again. And just like, what's another way this could, could be? Because that's the thing I see most often that helps. Um, and... The niche does not have to be just about who. It's one of the misconceptions around niching is that niching has to be just who. It could be what you do, where you do it, why you do it, when you do it. It's just the question is this. If you're going to niche around what you do, so the boat, it's just, is that boat in demand? You know, if Byron Katie goes on Oprah Winfrey and suddenly everybody's talking about the work of Byron Katie and you happen to be a practitioner, that may be all you need. 
uh, people found this with internal family systems. I was talking with somebody and it, for whatever reason, it got kind of big in certain places and you just had to be on the directory, man. And you were busy. That doesn't last forever. I'll say that. But then again, the who doesn't last forever. That will also shift who you work with. But so it could be who, what, where, when, why, or how. All of those are legitimate differentiators. Um, it just has to work. That's all. It has to feel good for us. And there has to be a response in the marketplace. It could be that you do something everybody else does, but the way you do it is different. So or what, so sorry. Uh, so wait, what I'm, what I'm taking away from that is that the confusion or the reluctance to niche down would best be solved by bringing more of myself to the problem. Cause there's probably something that I'm not, there's something that's important to me that I'm not really putting into this. And then Oh, only after that point worry about whether there's a demand for it conceptually to, like does that make sense it does it does of course this brings up um i don't know if you've seen my work around the artist and the entrepreneur in nation yeah yeah i mean you're describing that tension but what happens sometimes I see is people get so focused on the entrepreneurial side of niching which is who's the underserved target market who can i serve and this happened a few times in puttering sessions where people just can't fucking find it. They try and they try, they can't figure out a target market. And there's a certain point where I just, and that's the entrepreneur at work. There's a certain point I often just say, stop. Now go to the artist side. What do you want to offer the world? What's the thing that you would be most lit up to do? And then just go do that thing or go design that thing. And then once you've designed it, something that you'd be so excited to share, ask yourself, who would be into this? And then you go back to the niche, but with this thing that you're excited about, and you kind of reverse engineer the target market. And you think, well, these kind of people, these kind of people. Now, if you design something, you can't find anyone. I mean, well, back to the drawing board, you know, ask your muse for a better inspiration that somebody might actually be interested in. But, um, and some people, again, but some people, they get, they're just designing stuff and they keep making stuff and making stuff. And I would give them the opposite advice. Okay, I say, stop making stuff. <laughs> Look at the world of real people who have real problems and what's, what's an unsolved problem and could you create something for them? Yeah. So it's just yeah. good to notice which side you get stuck on. Okay. Thank you, Chad. Hey, that, that gives me something to work with. <laughs> Okay, good to see you. You too.